Good morning. It's good to see you all. Appreciate the presence of each and every one of you. Uh, if you're visiting with us, hopefully you got that welcome packet. And um, if you have not be able to fill out that visitor's card so we can just thank you for being here this morning. Um, we're going to be in the Gospel of John this morning. I invite you to open your Bibles there in just a minute. It's been a couple months since we've been in this series, but we're slowly working our way through the New Testament, asking the question of each book, why should I study this particular book of the New Testament? And Zach was commenting before the lesson, uh, before service this morning, that he might have given away my lesson at the table, and no, you didn't, although it was a good supplement. Uh, one of the unique things about John's gospel is he's explicitly writing from a post-resurrection viewpoint to tie kind of all of Scripture together uh, to show how it all is fulfilled in Christ, which Zach dealt, dealt with in, in some degree this morning, and I would encourage you to think on that theme this morning. But the reasons why we're going to be looking at why we should study John are actually the reasons John himself states why we should spend time with his gospel account. And I got three big reasons for you today. Two of them explicitly stated, or actually all three of them explicitly stated in one way, shape, or form, and then the, the lesson will be yours. We're going to be in John chapter 1 to begin with this morning. And the very first reason why we should say the gospel of John is so that we may know God. Clicker got working eventually. And you might be saying, well, that, isn't that the purpose of every book of the Bible? Yes, to some degree. But each of the Gospels we looked at so far had slightly different viewpoints or things they wanted to emphasize about the deity of Christ. Matthew, of course, shows Jesus as the long-awaited messianic king, and so it really, Matthew really emphasizes the kingship or lordship of Jesus. Mark wants to show Jesus as the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. That's why Mark spends so much time on the, on the Passion Week leading up to the crucifixion. Luke uh, wants to present the humanity of Jesus. Jesus as the God-man who felt and knew what it was what, it to, what was like to be a human and how he relates to you and I. But John wants to show us that if you ever want to know God, if you ever wonder what God would do in a certain situation, you need to look at the life of Christ. Because one of John's missions in writing his gospel account is to show beyond a doubt to his readers in the first century that Jesus' claims to divinity are true. And part of Christ's divinity, or, or part of those claims also, is that God dwelt in a human body. In John chapter 1, in verse 18, after John's prologue of of the beginning of all things, about how Jesus pre-existence with the Father. He talks about in verse 18, after Jesus came in human form, the incarnation. John writes that no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, that's Jesus, who was in the bosom of the, who in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. The New American Standard says he has explained him, that, that the idea that Jesus in the flesh has come to make God fully and finally known to his people. And one of the ways John does this through, I mean, yes, there's a few places in the gospel where he explicitly states it, but John oftentimes will do this through association. And one of the themes in John's gospel is that of light. And the light being identified with God himself, but also with Jesus. Look here on a couple scriptures here. Look here in verses 1 through 5 in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. 
Now, he will identify the him and the word as Jesus later on in this prologue, but look here in verse 9. Again, this association with life and light. It says, that was the true light in verse 9, which gives light to every man coming into the world, which is identified as Jesus in 17 and 18. So the readers of John's gospel and us, when we read these things, and when we keep reading and we read other statements of Jesus, but you know, we get over to chapter 8 and Jesus drops one of his I am statements. He says in John chapter 8 and verse 12, and Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Tying those things in the prologue to here in this, this statement. So yes, John will tell us that Jesus is God in various places, but John, like many biblical authors, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would rather show us rather than tell us. There's reasons for both those ways of, of teaching. And maybe to state the same point in a different way and looking at a different verse, but to really know God, one needs to know the life of Christ. You know, there's an occasion in John's Gospel which one of his disciples in chapter 14 was asking Jesus, show us the Father, you know, show us God. And we want to read Jesus' response here, starting in verse 7 of John chapter 14. He said, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and is sufficient for us. I want to pause there, and maybe it's just my brain how it reads it, but Philip asks this question as if though it's a minor thing. It just, just, just show us the show us God the Father, and that that that'll be just, you know it'll be enough. I mean, sometimes we don't realize the profoundness of the question that we're asking or what is being asked. I just want to underscore that because that should help us understand Jesus' words here a little bit better. Verse 9, Jesus said to them, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do not believe that I am, do you not believe that I am in the Father and that I speak to you, I... Um, the words I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me and does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Jesus' whole point with Philip here is, you ask to see the Father. I've been with you now all these years. If you have seen me and what I have done, you have seen the Father, for we are of the one substance. If you ever wonder what God would do in a situation, what God would say in a particular situation, you may not find the exact specific situations, but you fi find the situation that best approximates what you're going through in, in the New Testament, in the Bible, New Testament, and, and, and see what Jesus did or said there in, in response to that situation. I guarantee you that's what God would do in that situation. In fact, we had just referenced John... Chapter 8, a moment ago, you, know, you might be wondering, what, what would God do in this, in this case of injustice or this mischaracterization of justice? Well, John chapter 8 is one giant mischaracterization of justice. You get to see Jesus' response there. You might be wondering, did, does God even care about my pain or my sorrow, my loss? Look at John 9 with how Jesus interacted with the family of Lazarus. The names might be different, the situation is different, but the core response, that's what God would do. So to know Christ through John's gospel and the whole of the New Testament is, come, is, is to come to know God himself. So the, the more time we spend in John's gospel, the better we're going to come to know God. But there's another reason why we should study John's gospel, and that is that to strengthen our own belief. Many times John's gospel gets painted as the evangelistic gospel. It's the one to generate belief, and such it is. Do not get me wrong on that. 
But John's writing to largely Christians who are starting to doubt some core teachings of the Christian faith at the end of the first century. And so while somebody who's never come to faith in Christ can read John's gospel and have enough to make a decision for Jesus, let's not forget that this gospel is also for believers. And John's gospel can help strengthen our trust in God and the claims Christ made. Going to the end of the Gospel of John, which is part of our scripture reading, John explicitly says that the main purpose of his writing is so that those who would read would believe. Uh, should be 30 and 31, excuse me. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. It's not that maybe all the audience of John's gospel was having a crisis of faith. Some definitely were. But there's never a bad time to strengthen your faith in God. We'll be talking more about this as the year comes to a close, but Lord willing, we're going to be doing something really, really great next year. Uh, we're, we need to figure out the details, but we're going to be doing a series on, on evidences or apologetics to strengthen our faith. And I, I think it's going to be the third Sunday morning. We're still working on that, but you know, it, there's never a bad time to study the evidence to strengthen faith. And you can think as John's gospel is really an apologetic gospel. I don't mean that as he was sorry for anything, but he's setting forward a defense of the divinity of Jesus. Of the evidence that Jesus was and is who he says he is. And that's always a good thing to study. You know, and John includes in his gospel account many events and situations that created or generate or produced belief or faith in those who witnessed those events. I think of the miracle of Cana in John chapter 2. In verse 11, after Jesus had turned the water into wine, the first sign, John says, that manifested Christ's glory, it says here in verse 11, this beginning of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and note this, and his disciples believed in him. We just read a moment ago at the end of John's gospel. John's very transparent. says, I did not record everything Jesus ever did or said. In fact, the very last couple of verses of John's gospel, John says, it's impossible to record everything Jesus ever did or said. But what John does tells us, I have selected what I have thought, and by the inspiration, to be the best or the representative cases, pieces of evidence, lines of argumentation, the best case for you who read to come to believe in Christ. And I find it interesting, the first miracle John records is not faith producing in random people, but the original core group of disciples. We get to read about when those disciples came to believe in Jesus and his claims. And there's some about the Marikana that, that did that for them. But you might be saying, well, I, I, I can't live through those events. I'm not eyewitness to those things. So that's great that they, they could believe because of that. Well, John, even through arrangement of his gospel, tells us that his record itself can produce faith. I'm just going to recap shortly our scripture reading, but we, we, Chris read for us the Doubting Thomas, which unfortunately is a bad nickname for him because he's not really doubting. He, he comes to belief at the end of the gospel, so he's believing Thomas, but that doesn't really ring the same bell, does it? But Thomas, it's like unless I see the holes in his hands and put my hand in his side, I will by no means believe. By the way, you can't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. Because when Thomas shows up, Jesus is like, it, it's here, come here, stick your hand in, that's what you said. Uh, 
and at, at that point, T Thomas says, my Lord and my God, and what was Jesus' response? Because you have seen, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, and Jesus is not condoning a sort of simpleton, I, don't, I have no reasons to believe, and I'm just going to believe. No, he's not saying that. Jesus left a record. And it's after that instance that John records of doubting Thomas that he says then 30 and 31. These have been recorded that you may believe. You and I are not in the position of Thomas. You and I are in the position of every disciple since that first generation. We have to take the evidence either recorded or told to us by eyewitnesses, and we have to make an evaluation. What's interesting, though, is if you look at the history of the Christian church, why all the Gospels have been impactful, John's Gospel comes up over and over and over and over again as being the one Gospel that seems to get people to come to faith in Christ more than others. Now, that just may be the time and place in which we have records of, but John's Gospel it has a unique ability to do that for people, which makes sense because John's writing for that very purpose. So if you study John's Gospel, I think you will find that your faith in Christ and his mission, his plan, his promises will be greatly strengthened. And closely related to this one, the final reason to study the Gospel of John is to have eternal life. As John said at the end of verse 31, these have been written that you may believe, and by believing you may have life is in his name. John's not writing simply that we might just mentally agree with the truth claims of the Bible. No, there's, there's a blessing that comes with placing your, uh, uh, swearing your allegiance to Jesus. It's to have the promise of life that we read about in John chapter 1. In him was the light and life of men. In fact, when you look at John's gospel, you know, Matthew records the sermons of Jesus. That's, that's pretty important. Mark records what Jesus did, his miracles, his actions, his service. Luke records a lot of the parables and, and the emotions and how Jesus interacted with people. John really looks at the ministry of Jesus from a whole... Uh, a whole um, I'm blanking on a word, but a holistic perspective. There we go. And why did Jesus come to this earth? To give life. In John chapter 3, as our brother Zach read for us partly this morning in verse 16, but pick him in verse 10, when Jesus is talking with Nicodemus by night, Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus talking about the new birth. And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man will be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. That's the thrust of how John paints Jesus' ministry, and it's, it's, it's a true point. The first appearing of Christ was not for judgment or condemnation, but an offer of life-giving pardon. And John's ultimate aim in writing this gospel account is that all of us, whether we've never placed our faith in Christ or we're struggling in that or just need to strengthen our faith, that all of us would choose to follow Christ and by following him, 
would be the recipients of that promise of life. In John chapter 10, the apostle records these words of Jesus in verses 7 through 10. About Jesus' promise here of, of, of true life in him. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. That's why John wrote. And that's, one, that's the big reason why John wants people to read this gospel account. And for us today, if we are believers, I think John's reasons here are enough for why we should study this, this particular gospel account. It, it's to know God. It's to strengthen our faith. It's to continue to have the blessing of life through our relationship through Christ. But maybe you're not a believer. You know, John's gospel, as I said a moment ago, has presents a first century case for why one should believe in Jesus. And don't have time to do it right now, but I encourage you, if you've never maybe thought about Christ, maybe sometime this week, this month, take just the Gospel of John and read through it as honestly and objectively as you can. Now, there may be more evidence that you need, and I, I will tell you there, there is evidence out there to support the claims and corroborate the claims John makes. But John really presents the case. This is, this is the evidence of why I believe in Christ. And John's saying to us, I've shared this with you, that you may also believe, and by believing you may have life. So if you're here this morning, and maybe you've already done that, and you're ready to make a commitment to Christ, we'd encourage you to do so at this hour in just a moment. Uh, you can do that if you've, as Jesus himself said in Mark's gospel and, and Matthew and Acts, that he that believes in me and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. Um, Acts 2, the apostles preached, What shall we do to be saved from our sins? Did each one of you repent and be baptized remission your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've done that in the past, and you just need prayer. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, why don't you come forward and meet me down here at the front as together we stand and sing the song that's been selected.